Hello. Good morning. Is this working? Hello, we are about to start in five minutes, please. Five minutes. If the panelists can already come to the main table, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning in this session on prevention of youth violence through the use of ICTs. This is a session organized by UNESCO Social and Human Science Sector and Communication and Information Sector 
in the frame of a project we are implementing in the northern countries of Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, a region that is facing a delicate and extreme situation of violence that particularly is affecting youth as victims and as perpetrators. From UNESCO, we have been working on this project, strengthening capacities of youth to better use digital tools, digital competence for building peace and preventing violence, and at the same time, supporting the government to produce and implement better policies for the prevention of violence using technology and involving youth. Understanding that the situation of violence that is happening in Latin America as a whole region, and particularly in these three countries, is not going to have a solution just using internet and technology, but we are committed and we consider that technology can open some opportunities for the region to prevent more violence and to help our youth to build citizenship and new opportunities. In that frame, we organized this session for trying to discuss with our speakers how effectively really we think that ICTs can help us to prevent violence, to exchange some experiences from different parts of the world in a South-South cooperation on thinking initiatives that could be exchanged from Latin America but also from other regions, and also trying to find new recommendations and opportunities for policies to, how, to find out how we can include uh, internet ICT tools for the prevention of youth violence in a frame of respecting human rights, freedom of expression, and privacy. Is that why we have this very interesting session with our speakers today? I'm going to introduce them very quickly, the methodology we will use. Uh, we will make her, them some specific questions to know a bit more of their experiences, the situation happening in the region, their proposals for, for policy making, and at the end we will have uh, 30, 45 minutes of discussion with our offline and online uh, audience that is being with us uh, this morning. So I will begin with Ms. Adriana Abdenur, who is from Brazil, from the from Igarapé Institute. We also have Sara Frati from Fundación Avina in Guatemala, member of the Youth and Women chapter of ISOC. Uh, Ms. Nur Kabi from Tunisia, from Jamiti Youth Organization, and member of the NetMed Project in the Arab region. Ms. Divina Frumais from the University of Sorbonne in France and a good expert in, in, in these issues in Europe. And Ms. Juliana Nolasco from uh, Google in Brazil. Thank you very much for being with us, for sharing this uh, hour with, with, with our audience and, and with us in, in UNESCO. Um, I would like to start by uh, having this discussion, particularly with Adriana, who has a lot of experience working in Garapé Institute on the situation of, 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 of violence that is happening in, America, in Latin America, that you can briefly give us a context of the, of the situation of, of violence that is affecting the region and that at this moment, and that somehow, uh, sometimes it's not reflected that way in the, in, in the global agenda on the kind of, of, of sometimes extreme violence that is happening in the region, and particularly it's affecting youth. 
Um, thank you very much, Andres, and thank you to, uh, to UNESCO and to the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, I coordinate the International Peace and Security Division of Instituto Igarapé, which is an independent think and do tank based in Rio de Janeiro. And we're very happy to be here and to continue our collaboration uh, with uh, UNESCO Latin America specifically. So in Latin America, we live and have long lived through a paradox. We are the region in the world with the highest rates of murder and violent crime. Even though Latin America concentrates 38% of the world's population, it has 33% of the world's murders. So it's a very, very high concentration if you look at the global picture. Some of the countries in the region, including my own, uh, native Brazil, uh, are among the very highest uh, cases. Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela alone account for half of the murders. And out of the world's 20 countries with the highest murder rates, 17 are in Latin America. 43 of the top 50 cities uh, with highest murder rates in the world are in Latin America. These are very, very depressing statistics but they're also tragedies because they have affected the individual and collective lives of most of us. So the paradox is, if our lives are so deeply affected, whether by concrete cases of murder and other violent crime, uh, and we, are, we live in a culture of fear in light of this, why is the topic not on the, the agenda, not only of the international community, as Andres has put it, but also on national policy agendas? I think I'm not offering uh, uh, conclusions here. I think it's a complex political and social problem, but it helps us to understand why this issue is so uh, invisible uh, on the world stage as well as regionally. At Igarapé, we recently released a, 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 an analysis of the overall landscape of violence in Latin America. Um, I won't go into much, very much detail. It's called Shining Light on the uh, Violence in Latin America. And one of the things that we have found is, of course, that the distribution, geographic and spatial distribution of these patterns of uh, violence are not homogenous throughout the region. So we speak of pockets of where different types of risks for uh, violent crime concentrate. And for the most part, these are cities, but not necessarily. Organized crime, for instance, in the Amazon has generated uh, hotspots of violence that are not easily accountable for the drivers that we used to look at in past decades. So urbanization is among the main factors, but what we have to keep in mind is that the dynamics and the patterns of violence, they vary across time. This is not a static situation. The issue with inequality is also key to understanding not only the drivers, but how to tackle, including from a digital and ICT perspective. And we know that in addition to deep socioeconomic inequality, we had over the last 10 years the expansion of middle classes that nevertheless took on a very fragile manifestation, since in most of the continent, this expansion was driven by consumption and access to small credit. And this does not hold water when we hit a time of crisis, as has happened in Brazil. Of course, this has deep political repercussions. We recently had a far-right government with military background uh, elected back into power in Brazil. And it's not the only country in which discourses of discrimination and hate are becoming normalized and helping to drive new patterns of violence, including against vulnerable groups, as well as exacerbating um, existing patterns of violence. Uh, other problems, of course, involve weak institutions, corruptions, including of the police, but we know that some of the ma manifestations in cyberspace take the shape, for instance, of the selling of narcotics, uh, the uh, money laundering, extortion, recruitment of youth for illegal crime and organizations, use of the deep web, uh, cross-cutting all of these, 
uh, threats and increasingly for youth bullying and also electro violence as we have seen in the case of Brazil. So in Brazil, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you want some examples, I can go into them. We have different types of arrangements that combine government and civil society, often in partnership with the private sector. And I can provide some examples, but to, f to finish, I want to say that this is absolutely essential part of the solution, which is deeply political and cannot rely on ITCs alone, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Adri Adriana, for giving us a, a regional context on the situation and, uh, and raising a, a very important point on understanding that the situation of violence, it's not only being a, a solution with ICTs, but it could be bring a component for for, for, for the better policies on, on this topic. I, I would like to ask Sara from, from her experience in, in, in Guatemala to, to share with us how, how is the, the, the situation in, in your region uh, affecting youth and, and how the ICTs have been playing a role in, in, in youth violence. Well, first I have to thank um, UNESCO for this opportunity to bring up different uh, voices to these discussions. Uh, I think that we have to take a step back at first because we know that violence is a big issue in our countries, but we cannot think that uh, ICTs and technology and internet are going to change our lives and are going to help to prevent violence because the digital gap in our countries, especially in the Northern Triangle, are really big. Especially within women, young women, young indigenous communities also. I have, a, I have a, an example of this because last year we were, uh, I was coordinating a project called uh, La Carta de Derechos de Internet para Guatemala Guatemala, the Internet Bill of Rights for Guatemala, uh, coordinated by the Web Foundation, and we were uh, discussing around different issues related to digital rights in Guatemala, and we had different uh, events related uh, in different points of the country just to talk and uh, listen to the young people, women, and LGTB communities in order to just listen what they have to say about Internet, and uh, in one event, it, w it was like around 10 or 15 minutes from my, from my house, and uh, a, little, a little guy from this school, which is a, a red sun in Guatemala, told us about that his first time accessing it to the internet was last year. And I was really shocked because it was really close to my home. And I'm, I think that that story changed my life, like how we are addressing different issues like in this intellectual and high level ecosystem that internet governance is. And I, I really think that we have to lower this discussion, but lower with the key people that are really affected by these issues, especially youth, indigenous communities, and women and LGTB communities. Currently, maras or gangs are recruiting different youth in, in Latin America, especially in the Northern Triangle via social media. They are contacting the different youth people in, through Facebook, through, I don't know, Twitter, or different dating apps just in order to have, uh, for example, helping uh, different uh, issues related to extortion, as you said before, for example, uh, things related to uh, slave and sexual traffic. Also, we have this qu thing called sicarios, which are basically uh, paid killers, and they are being paid around $10 approx just to kill someone that doesn't pay the extortion and uh, gangs and different criminal organizations are, are contacting different people through especially young people through the internet and social media and it's really hard because I think that 
the violence itself is really focused in some areas in our countries, especially areas that are that that, ha that have really high inequalities and th that the government has has not working on this uh, and on these issues. Also, I think that at some point, criminal organizations are just adapting to the technology because we have to be clear that technology has made our lives easy in a good way or, or, in, a bad, or in a bad way also, but is they are just adapting and obviously internet and social media is probably uh, an easier way to contact uh, and hire, hire people to drug deal for example or just to uh, have all these um, issues related to the sicariato, the paid killers. Also um, I think that probably we have all this lack of education at first point and we have to address that before we can uh, develop capacities related to digital to digital technologies for example we have a really big um, rates of analphabetism in our countries also I, I know that is 2018 at this point and we are taking for for granted that most of the people are uh, are able to read and, and write, but the, for in our countries, mainly in the North Air Triangle, there are a lot of people that are not that they don't have like these capacities. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, for for sharing and raising a point that it's quite important on on, on how criminality and sometimes gangs in, 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 in this region are using online tools for, uh, for criminal acts, including extortion. In, in the frame of the project that we are running in, in the region with participation of the University of Simeon Cañas in El Salvador, we did a multimedia research on, on this topic particularly, on how maras and criminal gangs are using online to uh, recruit youth people. Uh, I would like to go to another side of the globe and go to the Arab countries and to, to share some experiences of, of how is the situation going on in, in, in those countries. Uh, that's why we think, Noor, your, your experience to share with us can be very helpful to find some similarities, but also a lot of differences from what's going on in Latin America, and obviously uh, the similarities and difference in, in, your, own, in your own region. Uh, thank you, Andres and uh, UNESCO for, having, for allowing me to, uh, to be among these uh, interesting uh, panelists. Um, first, uh, we need to make the distinction, as we are talking about the Arab countries, we, ne we need to assume and make the distinguish between uh, Arab countries as a whole and uh, the differences that exist within Arab countries, whether from uh, countries that are from southern Mediterranean or Gulf countries, etc. There are lots of differences between the the context, but also within the issues of young people. Of course, there are some similarities, but we need to distinguish and take into consideration all these differences between the countries. Uh, there was a study made by the uh, UNESCO within the NetMed Youth Project uh, about the participation of young people through uh, platforms uh, in the uh, countries of Southern Mediterranean that shows that um, the use of internet by uh, young people in these uh, countries is uh, very intuitive and mostly uh, around uh, social media rather than platforms as a whole. Uh, basically, the young people are looking for uh, more information and opportunities rather to express themselves and exchange on, uh, on platforms and uh, online platforms. Um, all the projects that were developed uh, within uh, Tunisia or even in Arab countries are basically targeting uh, youth participation online. And, this, and I want to make the link between youth participation and violence itself as violence is a direct consequence of the absence or the lack of youth participation in the public place in, uh, in general. And uh, we are, according to the same study also, uh, we are seeing that 
the young people are more likely to join local organization than national organization or regional organization because these local organizations are more likely to understand and to address their issues and concerns and, uh, and understand the specificity of the, their needs in the local, uh, local uh, country. Um, internet in uh, Arab countries uh, is promoting youth participation in a different way. We've seen through uh, lots of countries, such as Tunisia, where a uh, revolution had happened, that cyber activism um, has contributed a lot to these revolutions. And this, this is, uh, let's say, uh, a common effort between lots of community, whether civil society organization, but also um, uh, online uh, for bloggers, uh, uh, the open source community in Tunisia, which played an important role in promoting uh, such type of uh, messages. Um, in Arab countries also, we are also, we are talking about youth participation, but we are also talking about a specific kind of uh, violence, which is uh, terrorism. <laughs> Uh, and um, if, we, if we want to understand how terrorists are approaching uh, young people through uh, ICTs, we can uh, div divide it into four components. The first one is communication component, as they are using whether social media but also platform to disseminate uh, hate messages uh, and uh, some messages, whether ethical messages or religious method messages through internet or social media as a specific uh, the second one is to recruit uh, terrorists um, and uh, I think they are with according to different studies they are operating through first profiling the um, profiling the uh, uh, the potential uh, people that could join these movements and then approaching them as through Facebook uh, as it is one of the main uh, social media used in Arab countries by youth the third one is to intimidate people. Once there is a terrorist attack happening in Arab countries, the internet and social media specifically are used to, uh, to target a larger group than the ones that were targeted by the terrorist attack. Uh, so it's a way also uh, to intimidate the larger groups and to have more impact than the physical impact um, that we are witnessing in terrorist groups. And, and the fourth uh, thing is to communicate about their the, their action, which is uh, more likely to give them uh, notoriety within the internet community and influence uh, the public opinion in a direct way or in an indirect way. Thank you, Noor, for raising up the, the issue of youth participation and using digital tools. Uh, I think that's something that from your experience in, in, the, in the net med uh, project has been very, very useful and something that we, we should try to do in other regions, particularly in Latin America, and also raising the, the, the issue of, of how criminal acts can also happen online. Uh, you mentioned the communication of, of criminal acts, the recruitment. Um, I would like to ask Divina, uh, from your experience working this and, and, and knowing how the situation is, 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 is evolving in Europe, what, what are your, your thoughts on, on, on this issue? Thank you for, for having me here and including me in this, uh, this session, because um, of course the issues of youth and, um, and violence are, are close to my, uh, to my heart. I'll be speaking from a perspective of research uh, and from the UNESCO chair called uh, Savoir Devenir, can, can translate becoming, the same title as Michelle Obama's book, I'm very proud of myself. Uh, but, um, so I'll be speaking from a perspective of research because I think we can learn a lot from, uh, from each other and then also from my personal experiences with the association uh, Savoir Devenir, which has actions in, uh, in Tunisia, uh, Jordan, and uh, Morocco and uh, Palestine and uh, Cyprus, so areas where there are conflicts. So what to say about uh, research? It's, I think it, having research helps the invisibility problem. I mean, if you have publications, if you have the capacity to uh, enlarge knowledge to decision makers, to journalists, etc., cetera, um, producing a good quality research, you may be able to turn the issue into something more of a uh, uh, concrete uh, reality. Uh, and as you were um, talking, I was uh, 
uh, Tanya Masef, what do we know from the research? We did for UNESCO, uh, with two or three colleagues, uh, uh, research on the literature on extreme violence. And, and social media. You have it in English and in French on, on the UNESCO website. Um, and um, I think we can share some of those results and see that there is a convergence. Hmm? Uh, but what's interesting is that when we did the research uh, until 2016, Latin America was not appearing on the map of research. We had a lot of research coming from um, uh, Europe, from Northern America, from the Arab world, and there was nothing about Latin America, or rather it was obsolete in the sense that it was dealing with the violence in the military regimes in the 80s and 90s. We, we had a very hard time finding uh, elements for today. So maybe that points at a gap and uh, something that can be facilitated by comparison, by uh, extending uh, research platforms. But what we found for the research of today, um, that is based, of course, on a lot of uh, extremist uh, religions and extremist politics. Uh, and so there's two dimensions to this uh, uh, youth extremism, uh, one of them being uh, religion, the other one being uh, the extreme right, uh, racism, uh, etc. associated. And I'd like to share a few results with you because I think it can give us ideas on ways to go. I'll try to be quick, <laughs> but Noor has already mentioned uh, a few uh, elements. Uh, what we found, and I think it can be generalized, though of course as researchers we shouldn't, but I'm going to do it, uh, is uh, that um, extremists are early adopters of technologies. They are there before the police, before the parents, before the teachers. That's what we always underestimate. Um, and they, they use it for propaganda, for recruitment, for training. Um, it uses, of course, the, the, the networks because they are increasingly decentralized, so it escapes uh, national uh, perceptions. It uses encryption, it's, it um, uh, uses uh, the facilities of the internet for anonymity. And um, in fact, it turns out uh, in our research that a lot of the extremist groups uh, have been very innovative in their uses of the technology and of ICTs. So if you want to fight ICTs or we use ICTs to fight the ICT use, the negative ICT use, you have to know both sides. Um, so they're particularly innovative because, for instance, they used um, the transmedia dimension of uh, social media. So you produce something on YouTube, it will be uh, repeated uh, on Twitter, uh, it will be part of uh, chat rooms and websites, um, and it will move from the, the blue net, uh, the net of social networks, uh, to the dark net very easily. Uh, they, they can go both ways, uh, whereas most people stay on the blue net. Uh, that you stay on, on Twitter, etc. You underestimate once more the power of the dark net. They've done very good high quality production messages, which is going to touch young people because they're extremely sensitive to that. They have huge volume, it's not just one little video of somebody being um, killed somewhere, uh, it's a lot of them. And they also use many different narratives, and I insist on the word narrative because that touches all of us, and it's not just technology connected, it's how we humans uh, can use words to hurt each other and to love each other. But, uh, so they use a ton of narratives. They use narratives of brutality, narratives of mercy, narratives of victimhood, narratives of war, narratives of belonging, narratives of nostalgia, and narratives of utopianism, creating a better world somewhere. So, and that touches young people who are looking for vision in uh, their life. So they're pro providing narratives that the real world is not providing anymore. And that's the responsibility of adults. So, internet doesn't radicalize on its own. Um, it takes offline people to create the problem. And it's, the problems are, have to be resolved offline. This is where we live together. Uh, but, uh, recruitment offline and recruitment online meet and converge. And that's something to be um, careful because that's what activates violence. So you can be violent in your head, in your words, the actually acting out, going out there and killing and killing oneself in the process, which I find incredibly detrimental to any image of youth. Uh, that's, that's possible. Uh, this convergence is what we have to look after. And social media 
will help radicalization and amplify it, but not the ones we think about. And we are, t we are accusing Twitter and Facebook, etc. But please think about private one-to-one -one messaging because that's where it's happening. That's where it's being organized. That's where you go on a square and blow yourself up. And there's a lot of grooming. And um, the other uh, elements of facilitation to take into account for the solutions, especially for media and information literacy, which I'm going to uh, talk about in a minute, huh? How does this get facilitated, um, radicalization? Echo chambers, people meeting among each other, n lack of diversity in point of views, um, uh, being embedded and comforted in your own belief, including when it's a terrible belief. Um, uh, anonymity, fake news, disinformation, of course, it's bigger and bigger, including in your countries, and social isolation. And I think we all underestimate how young people in situations of violence, in fact, are isolated, even within a gang. Um, and all these issues, I think, uh, are the ones who should uh, uh, help us figure out the solutions. The, the solutions um, um, are, um, I'm trying to find my slide about that, uh, appear, and I'm going to deliver them to you fast, then we can go back on it for sake of conversation. Uh, digital media literacy crucial it's the best filter but it's the longest filter so politicians are reluctant to go for it uh it's often given to associations associations have good practices there's no general policy you don't advance on that so we have to put digital mail on top of the agenda of education of participation Produ producing uh counter narratives to what young people are hearing on these networks. This is very important. Research proves that it's not working very well, but it doesn't mean we have to quit. Um, new engagement models. Young people want to engage for something worth fighting for. So if you give them drugs, can't we think about an alternative to give them to fight for? Like the future of their country? Um, and then the other two elements that are crucial um, for uh, the, the solutions uh, are critical engagement and so once more it's about engaging critically knowing where you are being able to criticize the party the gang whatever uh, without being killed <laughs> and um, more and more we see it and I think that's also what UNESCO is proposing is is a multi-stakeholder uh, involvement you can't ask the state to do it on its own you can't ask schools or education to do it on its own you can't ask a private sector to do it on its own but we have to get these different entities to speak to each other thank you divine and for, for for these different concepts and it seems there's a lot of patterns as you can see in the different interventions and it seems that criminal actions seem to be more effective online than the actions for preventing using online for, for preventing violence. Uh, in that sense, I would like to ask Juliana, uh, uh, working for Google, uh, how realistic do you think there, there is in, 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 in the short term to think in using ICTs as, as a tool to, to prevent violence? Uh, some of the experiences that, that you can share with us. Okay, hello everyone, good morning. Thank you for this invitation. I'm thrilled to be here to share this panel with such amazing people. And there is this huge challenge because I'm always the last one to speak and then <laughs> I change my whole presentation to try to touch on some points that you brilliant discussed here. So I'll try to touch on some of the issues that my colleagues brought and brought some examples that we have been working at Google, okay? So, uh, as Adriana and Sarah said, internet will not alone end violence, but I think that we have an opportunity here to be a platform of change. Uh, Noor talked about developing, capa developing capacities and Divina talked about the power of counter-narratives. So I would like to share how we are at Google invested to deal with, with, with those issues on our products and how we have been trying to enhance capacity building and the power of youth to produce counter narratives, okay? So at Google, we believe that the internet has enhanced youth capacity to learn new things and to be heard. So they have been producing content like never before, new music, new videos, text, but however, they're always, they're 
uh, have always been legitimate limits for that because we do understand that sometimes there is content that some, pe some people might find offensive or, con or controversial. So we are committed in changing that and we care. So uh, we have been developing content policies that draw responsible lines about what content we do and do not allow in our platforms. And by that, I mean prohibitions on terrorist recruitment, uh, hate speech, and incitement to violence that all of them talked about this today. But I would love to bring a great example that we have been working. We have two amazing projects at Google that deals with the counter speech issue because we believe that good speech can draw out and be more powerful more powerful than the bad speech. So the first one I would like to bring here is Creators for Change. It's an amazing project that we have at YouTube that empowers youth and creators to produce good content online, to produce good narratives, to produce counter speech. So it's a worldwide program. In Brazil, we have two amazing ambassadors. So Divina talked about role models. So uh, we have Murilo and Natalie that have been working with Afro-Brazilian issues and they are uh, creators for change ambassadors in Brazil. And we are enhancing their power to produce narratives at YouTube and their power to produce good outcomes and impact. Uh, we also have a program in Brazil that's called the Safer Lab. The Safer Lab has been working with a thousand uh, teenagers and young adults in Brazil. And we have been, and this project tries to empower and to connect youth through counter narratives. So we have a, an amazing example of a guy that is from the north part of Brazil. And then he's a poet and he lives on a quilombo which is an Afro-Brazilian community, and he doesn't have access to the internet. So every day he takes a boat, it's a 30-minute ride, to get to Manaus, uh, it's the capital of the uh, Amazonas state, and then he goes there to use the internet and do research on what type of poetry could bring, I don't know, um, empathy for, for his community. So he's practicing, uh, he's doing an, an empathy exercise through art and then through the Safer Lab program he started working with different types of youngsters in his public schools so they, can, could own, that they could build their own poems trying to bring uh, a different situation to what they have been facing. Uh, Safer Lab is working uh, nowadays with a hundred uh, groups of youngsters on and we are going to finance some of their projects and they're both online and offline. So the idea is that those who doesn't have access to internet, as Sara said, we, this is a Latin America situation. We have a huge digital bridge in the, in the region. So we could enhance their capacity both online and offline to deal with hate speech. Uh, I would like also to share with you some media literacy experiences that we have been uh, promoting in Brazil because uh, we believe that all this capacity building process, uh, it passes through the way that youngsters, that youth understand in the internet. So we have been working with the Ministry of Culture in Brazil uh, to create content for media literacy programs that can be used in public schools. Finally, we take online safety very seriously. So we build, we build safety controls so parents can decide what type, what type of content their families can access. So we have, for example, Safe Search that helps people avoid content that they pre may prefer not to see or would rather members of the family uh, did not see. And finally, I would like to share with you the B Internet Awesome program, which is an amazing program so we can teach kids how to be good citizens, online citizens, so they can learn how to share with care, how not to fall for fake content, and how to be responsible uh, about the content they access as well, because we believe that we should empower our kids and our youth to be responsible online. So that's it for now. Oh, I'll be happy to elaborate more on the round of Thank questions. Thank you, Juliana. And I think we will keep with you not, for not for you always the last one. This time you're going to be the first one. Wow. So okay. um, if you shared with us some of, of, of the experience in this case from, from Google, from the private sector, and there are many different experiences from civil society. Um, 
let's try to think on, on how this engage with, with, with policies. Um, from your point of view, how, what kind of recommendations do you think we should think for, for, gov for governments to include ICTs in the prevention of, of violence, particularly affecting youth that are engaged with this kind of initiatives and projects that, in your case, Google is running up, but also different projects. What, what kind of recommendations we can do for, for, for policies? So, uh, we believe that it takes, it, as I said, there is no silver bullet, and it takes a multi-stakeholder approach for that. So, an example of that is that uh, we have been working with a, an organization in Brazil that's called SaferNet, and we have organized, um, uh, because we believe a lot in capacity building, and that can change the way that we access and that we see internet uh, in the present and in the future. So we have been working with SaferNet and with some secretaries of, of education in Brazil, and we are producing content uh, that deals with online child safety and good ways on which people can protect themselves on the internet. And we organized some trainings so public uh, teachers from the public system in Brazil could teach online safety on the classroom. So this is one type of idea. We, uh, we have a lot of content that we can work with uh, the Ministry of Education, Secretaries of Education, with public policy. So together with NGOs and as companies and uh, with the government, we can help on these capacity building processes. Uh, in the same line, Divina, you, you already mentioned some of, uh, of your recommendations, but it would be interesting to, to hear from you um, how we can think on, on, on doing some of these recommendations in, in a frame of, of respecting human rights of, of youth, particularly freedom of expression and, and privacy, uh, how we are able to, to, to develop better policies that of course, respect human rights. Well, yes, and I think it, it's partly having a, a certain definition of media and information literacy, uh, which is uh, uh, to ensure that uh, it is about uh, human rights. And for me, there are five principles that are part of the human rights that are particular to media and information literacy. It's um, Article 12 on privacy, Article 19 on freedom of expression, Article 26 on education, 27 on participation, and one on dignity. I think these are the main ones we can use and teach children. We can't hope <laughs> to teach all of them, but if we already focus on this, it will give them self-respect, which is what's happening, which is one of the problems with lots of young people. They don't have self-respect. In the research and the project we did in ECFOLI, uh, including Cyprus, uh, Palestine, Morocco, and Portugal, um, we uh, made the children from divided communities speak to each other and they hadn't spoken to each other for years because the parents were not um, allowing them to speak with each other. And in some cases, countries divided by a wall, and so it's very physically visible. Sometimes it's a mental wall. Uh, you can have uh, very symbolic types of violence. And what uh, we realize is that um, uh, to empower young people and enable them to speak out and create uh, their own videos, etc. They had to believe that they had something to say and to, and to do. And, uh, and so a lot of the teaching is about not inheriting the violence from the adults, which is very hard. And this is where ICTs are useful because you can create communities online that do not reflect the real life communities and where the children can be allowed to be somebody else, somebody different, somebody who loves peace or who is fearful or who'd like integration. And um, uh, by having these kids meet in other countries than their own, uh, it's not about separating them from their culture, but it's often taking them to a time where their culture was peaceful and was a great culture before the conflict, which they don't have, so no pride. So in Palestine, you know, it was really shocking. You have young people training how to shoot on their uh, art treasuries. They, they shoot at statues uh, that are 300 years old, 3,000 years old. When this happens, you know that there is a real problem. And so uh, it is about telling them you have 
an environment that is a great environment. Cherish that and you cherish yourself. And often you can combine this with environmental issues. We're extremely worried about global warming, etc., etc. So take them out of that frame of they killed my family, so I have to kill back. There is a, the duty of vengeance and revenge, etc. That's that's what we have to educate um, for that kind of peace. But you have to use the technologies to get them out of their real life situations so that they can express that. And in Cyprus, what was interesting is that we hadn't talked about these things. We tried to make them see things differently. The video they produced at the end is a video about uh, uh, two young friends, a boy and a girl, and there's a partition 50 years back, 60 years back now, and the girl loses a medallion, and the boy keeps it on the other side. And then one day, but they are six, 50 years older, so they are old people, um, on the day that they start reopening the buffer zone, uh, they meet and he gives her back um, her medallion. What the kids were saying is, we are fed up with your nonsensical goddamn violence and we can keep treasures for a long time and share them. And that's what I want to keep as a message for us. When you let them speak for themselves, they don't go for, for war. Okay? And we shouldn't crush that in them. So as a result of that, we are proposing the creation of SMILES, Synergies for Media and Information Literacy in Education, centers in each country. We're, trying, we're developing one in Tunisia, we're going to do one in Palestine. Uh, well, that one's actually acted and, and signed. Uh, one in uh, Jordan and hopefully in Latin America. What are SMILES about? They're about smiling. They're about telling children there is hope. We, we can't deny you the hope of your own uh, expression and your own emancipation. Um, and we're going to help you with others from outside also, because inside you are in a very toxic situation and we have to get you out also. You have to breathe something different, a different air. And I'm thinking about the children of FARC, for instance. Uh, how do you reunite, uh, even though there's a law saying it's fine, it's over, how do you get these people to speak to each other? when they have been trained to think the other side is the enemy. This is a huge task. Um, so you have to have these centers that are safe havens where people from different perspectives can come and talk and exchange and then look together for solutions. So smiles have to be um, places that are multi-stakeholder, that are places for debate, where there is research and researchers involved because they always help put different words on a situation, or sometimes just help put a word on it. Um, you need to have a different sectors uh, involved, the private sector, public sector, etc. I admire the, the work of Google, and I'm always fed up of talking after Google, because I always have to tell Google, you're doing it, the way you're doing it, you have to be careful. Because it's like asking Coca-Cola to teach kids about sugar. Okay? If you're not involved clearly in a multi-stakeholder approach, Everything you're going to do from a perspective of research is going to be suspicious. From the perspective of a community of male, and it's a big community that is now a, a global alliance for partnerships, you're going to be suspicious because we are fed up, the researchers, the community of teachers, etc., to develop um, frameworks of competencies, uh, frameworks of how to go about policy, how to go about teacher training, how to go about uh, creating um, uh, ambassadors among young people, and Google arriving and saying, we're doing it. And so it can't be evaluated. We don't, Google says it works, but when I say Google, I'm taking you as an example, huh? but I'm saying lots of other, other groups huh? that are well-meaning, don't get me wrong, huh? but it makes it very hard because then you have a feeling that um, you are not independent uh, that the money is not independent, the research is not independent, and so it's going to be suspicious. And that, that pushes us down, and we have been fighting, this community is a large community, very generous for, for years, to give credibility to research on media and information literacy, to ask for evaluation. For instance, uh, at the high-level group uh, of experts uh, uh, on fake news, uh, that is the European one, uh, we ask specifically for male competences to be part of PISA, to be evaluated from the teaching community, not from the GAFAM community, so that teachers can empower themselves and say, this is it, and we can prove it. 
And so we can find new competences. So we can say, today the competence we're focusing on is critical thinking. Tomorrow it's going to be on conflict resolution. I never hear these competences mentioned by the private sector. Because, of course, they go on very hands-on approaches. They are operational competences, fine. But that's not how you're going to transmit values. Because the way we try in our community to frame the competences, we say they're, they're like a butterfly. Four wings of the butterfly. They're beautiful butterflies in the Amazon. One wing is, yes, operation. The one-fourth that is done by the, public, the private sector one-fourth of all what's needed in a competence. Huh? So being able to be skilled, important. Um, then knowledge. What are you doing? What are you transmitting? How are you building it? What is this war you're involved in? Do you really want to inherit it, etc.? Knowledge. Then there is values and ethics. And I'm forgetting the fourth one because I'm a little bit um, troubled right now, but there, there are really these four arms of competences that are important to understand that we've developed also with the Council of Europe, with uh, institutions that are attached to the human rights, and this is what I wanted to finish upon to answer your question. It's really the butterfly of competences. Having one only, the skills only, makes not the butterfly fly. And we want the butterfly to fly. Thank you. <coughs> At the end, maybe we, we end the interventions and, and you can do your replication. And Noor, please yes. change, uh, tell us a bit of, of, of your experience and, and how we can empower youth as change makers yes. using um, ICT. Yes, as, as I said, youth violence is a consequence of uh, uh, unresolved youth issues in general and uh, social, economical, cultural and political exclusions. So our response to, uh, to end violence or at least reduce violence among youth is to have this multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach. The other thing is we talked about the importance of internet of promoting uh, youth participation but uh, promoting youth participation cannot be done if there is no access to internet. I mean, the youth participation is promoted as there is internet access. So we need to give equal access to internet to all young people all over the world, and especially in Arab countries. The second thing, it is important to continue to develop all these projects about education to information, media literacy, etc. But it's also important to coordinate with other projects, other grassroots projects that are dealing with particular issues of young people to integrate them better in the... In the uh, in their life and make them real uh, change, uh, change makers. Uh, the thir second, third recommendation is to enable all these young people to have the analytical skills through provi providing them with tools and resources through all these platforms that have, are developed for young people so they can have this critical thinking to uh, analyze better the information that are available uh, on the internet. Then uh, we need to sensitize them also to, towards more ethical issues, but also uh, moral and judicial uh, issues, and take into consideration while developing op uh, the project, all, the, all these projects, the diversities that are um, among youth and the, their issues. Um, and then we are noticing that in each of our respective countries, there are a group of potential change makers. It's important to uh, allow the networking between all these change makers because we are going to build on their respective experiences. This exchange could be an online exchange, but we need also to take the offline component of each project as a core element of the, uh, of the success of each project. Um, and finally, uh, to end with, because um, I don't know, uh, we don't have enough time, um, we need to be able as international organization, but also as national organization and grassroots projects to evaluate the efficiency of our projects. Uh, because now the, this question of uh, fighting or uh, fighting against violence among youth is a trend. 
uh, in Arab countries, it's not called like this. It's called uh, countering violent extremism or PVE, preventing violence extremism. It's an international trend, and it's uh, for, in, for international organization, but also for national one. It's a way also to survive as, as institutions. So we are applying for projects and funds uh, on these issues. But to what extent are these projects efficient enough, and to what extent these projects really take into consideration the issues uh, on, uh, on young people. So as an institution, we need also to have this critical thinking about our intervention and to what extent are we coordinating with other organizations to really have an impact on the young people, whether on the short, uh, medium or long term. Thank you. Thank you, Noura. Great. Um, Sarah, please uh, share with us some, some of, of, rec of your recommendations to to include ICTs, particularly in the frame of, of, of respecting human rights? I have uh, three re basic recommendations. The first, the first one is just listen to the young people. Create safe spaces in order to young people can uh, share their voices on how they are t uh, tackling and using ICTs in order to prevent violence and how they are using technology to create local uh, content, content in their own language, for example, especially in indigenous communities, how they are using technology in order to promote art, for example, or just to map uh, the points of, uh, of violence in their communities, for example. Also, the second one is to develop policies and, uh, and laws with the multi-stakeholder approach, this one is really basic because we don't, in, we don't want to ban all the technology because the orga criminal organizations are using technology and the internet to recruit young people. We need to address the problems behind these recruitment processes. Also, I think that we have uh, to well, the other one is to focus on human rights and the policies and regulations have to, uh, have, to have a, a gender perspective, for example, also human rights perspective, and we need to understand and make understand the policy makers how we are using the technology. And we, and, and, and as I am saying we, I'm talking about the youth people also, I'm not getting any younger at this point of my life, but I know that a lot of young people over there have a, a lot of things to say related to how they are using technology because I'm clearly not using technology as, uh, for example, uh, indigenous uh, woman of 15 years old in Guatemala, clearly she's using technology in another way She's using probably technology in order to help their family to get uh, some, something to eat at the end of the day, for example, or she's probably looking for work or something. Um, we need to understand how technology is changing our lives for better or bad, but we need to have like uh, the human rights perspective just in order to understand that just, uh, for example, Putting, uh, uh, putting like um, mass surveillance cameras around uh, red zones is not the solution because this this thing is going to be reinforcing all these stereotypes and all the in inequities related to uh, violence in our countries in Latin America. And those are like my reflections and recommendations for pol policy makers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, Adriana, maybe perhaps from your experience in Brazil, uh, can you share some strategies used in, in your country using ICT for, for prevention violence? Um, well, thank you. In Brazil, uh, we see that there's a very uh, complex ecology of different actors involved. And we have a report uh, from Instituto Igarapé that provides a typology and a, very many examples of different platforms, whether they were initiated by citizens or by government, uh, sometimes in partnership with the private sector. But I'd like to add three recommendations to those noted by uh, my colleagues. 
The first one has to do with research. I'd like to reinforce the call for more research, but also to add a caveat. We cannot import conclusions taken from other regions to Latin America. The drivers and the dynamics of violence in Latin America are very much different. Just to cite two differences here from this discussion, uh, the ways that the Maras and other organized crimes uh, organizations, the networks in Brazil and uh, other places in Latin America recruit and go about disseminating and communicating, they differ quite a bit from uh, the terrorist organizations present in other parts of the world. And since in other areas of policy we've often had the importation uh, of policy recommendations based on that type of research, we clearly need local and Latin American research, including by Latin Americans. Um, we also know that um, it may be in contrast to Tunisia, for instance, the drivers of youth violence and the effects of violence on youth, they're also driven by a drug policy, they're driven by arms policy, um, and therefore th those need to be tackled. ICTs will not resolve the problems based on participation alone. The second recommendation is that the best practices from that evidence-based research then be incorporated into planning for uh, national security, state-level security, municipal, and so forth. Um, you cannot have a patchwork approach alone. You need to embed the use of ICTs for uh, violence prevention within broader approaches that also take into account what goes on in, in quote unquote real life. So we need to understand what's going on in cyberspace, but also how that articulates with the real life and design solutions accordingly. And third, and I would say most importantly, we need to protect democracy and prevent the capture of ICTs for authoritarian purposes. At this particular time, this is absolutely crucial because we see a wave of conservatism coming into the region. It's not affecting all of the countries, but there's a history already, this is not specific to Latin America, of governments and private companies using technology for surveillance and to criminalize activists and others mostly youth. So we need to prevent, this is a broad political uh, call, but without this, all of the other recommendations do not hold. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, as we are talking this part of the, of the session about policy, we, we invited to this session to the director of the Institute of Youth of El Salvador to exchange some of of her experiences, she was not able to come, but she wanted to, 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 to share some thoughts from the policy uh, perspective. Sorry, the, the audio is not working. Um, we have her, 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 um, the audio in, in the UNESCO channel in, in, in YouTube. You, you can find it there. Um, the, the Institute of Youth has been a, a, a great partner of UNESCO working on, on this project on prevention youth uh, violence. Uh, no, see, no, if we are running out of time, but uh, Juliana, you wanted to do a, a replicate this. One minute, so thank you so much. It's always good to come to those spaces. This is why we come. We come to build dialogue and to learn new things. And we know that we don't have all the answers and all the necessary content to deal, to tackle with the misinformation issue and to deal with media literacy programs. And this is why we need to work in partnerships with NGOs. So I just briefly would like to bring here three experiences, amazing experience that we had in Brazil. So the first of one, the first of them uh, is that we are sponsoring four different think tanks to produce research on media literacy and the misinformation phenomenon in Brazil to try to understand from a science uh, basis what's happening in the country. So we, they probably will get it done by uh, next year so I can share the results with you and they can share the results with you. 
We have also sponsored a project with Lupa, which is a fact, uh, fact checking agency in Brazil. So they could de develop their own uh, media literacy programs in public schools in Rio de Janeiro. They have done three different workshops and all the content they produce is uh, online for everyone that wanted to use that. We have also sponsored a noise that's uh, um, uh, a school of journalism for the peripheries in Sao Paulo. So they work on the favelas and they are working to sponsor the, prof the professor's own media literacy, media literacy programs. And why is that? We know how challenging it is to get to the peripheries, to the favelas in Brazil, and what type of content is legitimate for the professors to use. So they are doing a, a, like different types of workshops and trainings with this school of journalism, and then they are going to build their own media literacy programs and, and noise will grant their, their projects. Uh, finally, we worked with Palavra Beta, which is a think tank that works towards freedom of expression in Brazil, and they worked with Nova Escola, which is an organization, an NGO that works with the, system, with the educational system in Brazil. So, so they built a media literacy program during the elections in Brazil, and they trained already one million professors in the country through online training. So, that's it. We, we truly believe that we need to work in partnerships. I would love to talk to you later on to understand uh, SMILES, which is, it sounds an amazing project, and what we could do to, to advance in our approach on media literacy as well. Thank you, Juliana. Could I we just, just add the, the last wing of a butterfly? I forgot the word and I found it again. It's the word attitude. So it's, it's about skills, attitudes, knowledge, and uh, values. Okay, thank you. We're ju we just have 15 more minutes and we would like to open the floor to the audience to any comments, questions from, from you to, to reach this, this discussion. Anyone? Yes, you. Can you introduce yourself? And Can you? Okay. So, uh, my name is Fawad Khan. I'm from University of Oulu, Finland, uh, and also from YCIG. Uh, I manage a career working on digital literacy as well. So my question would be regarding digital liter literacy as she, uh, uh, I think, Deviana, right? Uh, I'm sorry. For so you mentioned about the teachers and the PISA and all these uh, private sector institutions in education. Uh, uh, I want to have your comment on the digital literacy. When we talk about digital literacy uh, and media literacy, so it's like a field that's like emerging and every every next day we have a new challenge. And that challenge is not for only the, 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 the youth, we can call them students, but also for the teachers. So in order to coping with that, uh, I mean, uh, teachers also need skills, obviously, and majority of the teachers we see, in, and if we talk about the, in a global perspective, we see that there is a lack of digital literacy among the teachers. But additionally, when you talk about the values and the, the, uh, the, 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 the community engagement, how is this possible to be implemented practically when you talk about the OECD PISA and the performance of the schooling that's measured on different skills, though there is, the, there is one scale of digital literacy also involved in that, but that, that does not represent the whole global perspective. That only represents some part of the world. We can call it so-called developed world. But how can be, it, it, it can be practically implemented within the community and the societies to, to improve the digital literacy among the teachers because it will go from top, it, it's a, I, would, I see it as a top-down approach. So if the teachers are more aware of the problems that what are the challenges in today's time and additionally putting on this question into perspective of teaching and learning process. So uh, this is also, a, my, uh, like when I did my research, it's also a problem that the content that is provided or delivered in the teaching and learning process within the classroom has also sometimes political or economic agenda behind that. So how, the, how these institutions are going to tackle that thing, that the content they're showing or that, that they're trying to provide to the, to the children or to the students in their lecture. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was me. <laughs> So how, how, how that can be addressed in the curricula of the, of the governments or the countries? Thank you. So, sorry, yeah. but we're going for a round of questions. Uh, I'll start and maybe my colleagues can add, but um, 
uh, you've hit it on the nail, of course. <laughs> that is the moment where we are. Um, media information literacy is very rich in good practices and in resources produced by a ton of different groups and people, but rarely from the school and validated by the schools. So this is what is lacking because it doesn't give uh, legitimacy to the teachers to use them or when they do it, and they, they do it from the bottom up, which is to say they do it among themselves, they don't dare spread it, they, they keep it sort of, um, and that's problematic because you can never reach a national level, which is w what we need. We have a lot of these things, they never reach a national level, which is to say they continue reinforcing social injustice on the territories. Those territories that are rich, with resources and uh, methodologies, etc., are going to be continuing being rich in mail, and those that are not are going to keep uh, being poor. So that's why it is imperative that it becomes part of national policy. And it is not happening. Partly because uh, of the positioning of media and information literacy traditionally, uh, the community has always said that it's transversal because the idea was to try to get there, so it's, it's transversal to the, the native language, it's transversal to history and geography, so teachers of history can do it. In many countries, that's how it's taught, and it's taught in the native language and in the history and geography uh, sections. That doesn't, it never allows you to evaluate male, it, evalu it allows you to evaluate French, evaluate history, not male. So we have to make it into one discipline that is part of a core basic curricula. And there you have resistance from all the fronts. Trade unions, no way. Teachers, too much time. Uh, parents, that's, they already have too much technology at home, etc., etc. Politicians, oh my God, you're giving them the tools to criticize us? So you see the problem. Everybody agrees male is a solution. When it comes to implementation, everybody agrees to stop it. Right. So, if we don't have a frank, transparent dialogue about what it is about and how to go about it, it's going to be difficult. Now, some countries are trying, and they're saying, in fact, we have to change the core basic curriculum of literacies to be in the 21st century. And, and they're saying, it's not about male, and I, I agree with them, they say it's about multiliteracies. It's about all these things that we know are necessary to be a 21st century citizen. So it's about voting literacy, it's about uh, climate uh, literacy, uh, it's about uh, LGBT or whatever literacy, you know, knowing all these different things uh, that are necessary to, to be together in the 21st century that are not necessarily based on learning to read and write. And that's very painful to hear. And the time uh, lag between sw switching from these 19th century literacies to the 21st century literacies is going to be a problematic time. We're going to make mistakes. It's going to be muddy and murky. Uh, we're not settled about what these uh, 21st century skills are about. Um, but it is about trying and offering it as an alternative. And so the countries that are doing that, in case you want to look at um, there, because I believe that in today's global planet, it is good to look at other examples, even if they have to be localized, I think we all agree on that, huh? uh, are Sweden and Finland. Small countries where it's sort of easy, in a way, to go for these things. Huh? Big countries like Brazil or France, whew, it's very hard. Huh? But what's sure for me huh, is that if it doesn't happen in the schools, it's going to happen there. It's going to happen in the digital world because I understand Google and the GAFAMs. They are not getting the workers of tomorrow that they need now because school is also about training people to be workers in the 21st century. And so if you're not offering it at school over the 18 years that you're allowed to go to school, you're going to get a one-year or a one-month training by the GAFAMs, and they're going to say that you're going to deliver a certificate, and they're going to say, you can go be a good entrepreneur online. So we have to be responsible, and this is not against the GAFAMs, hmm, but it's about how we continue uh, our national uh, culture, how we transfer a lot of the values that we have accumulated from the past into the 21st century as a collective over the 18 years of 
um, or 16 or 13, whatever, compulsory uh, education. Ask Microsoft. Microsoft doesn't want to train people for 13 years. It's extremely costly. It is not their mission. So we are being irresponsible when we let these things happen and we don't try to see how we can bring them back into a fold that, that creates a global vision of education that needs to change because it is obsolete. So I don't know if I answered your question, but this is where, where I'm standing in my thinking at the moment and um, hitting my head against the walls, telling myself, why can't we get through this? Thank you, Divina. There is another question in the, or a comment in the back, please, madam. Yeah, uh, I'm France Marquet, representing the Madan Jit Singh Foundation. Um, and as an outcome of the UNESCO Madan Jit Singh Prize for Tolerance and Nonviolence in 2014, uh, the winner was a Chilean, and when he went back to his country, he asked for a UNESCO chair on tolerance and nonviolence, who was set up at the Universidad uh, Metropolitana de Santiago de Chile. That means the uh, university which um, trained the teachers. So that was a very wonderful outcome of this prize, and I think it goes in... Uh, the way you were talking about to expand it in South America, how we can teach people, I mean teachers, against violence and um, so that's my contribution. Thank you. Someone else has a comment or a, a question? Ah, sorry, there's a, uh, please. Of, co of course you should. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Huh? Is that all right? Ah, thank you very much. Uh, I am the former ambassador of Honduras and the former president of the executive board of UNESCO. And uh, I want to congratulate you, first of all, all of you because this problem, it's a very painful problem. And especially as the Brazilian lady said, the causes in Latin America are different. And uh, in the past, the only, the only thing I wanted to say is that uh, I am happy to see that Asia says is taking uh, care of this project. In 2008, we had this project too, and um, my concern is that sometimes in UNESCO we have fantastic documents, fantastic research, mm -hmm. and we forget about them. Yeah. And maybe if we consult them, it will help us to have a, a better understanding and use of what it has been done and the money that has invested, because I remember Director General Kochiro Matsura invested a lot of money in Japan, Japanese phones in this project. This, uh, I remember we, uh, the project was working very well, but then political problems in my country stopped the project. The project was to apply in my country, the project Escolas Abiertas, which, was, which had very successful in Brazil. And it, and it was very successful in my country, but it had to be stopped. Uh, because uh, uh, also, I think that uh, SHS uh, point of view to approach this problem has a, a, a very, very uh, relation with the illiteracy, with fight illiteracy. Because as the lady said, the narratives the narratives and the counter-narratives. Narratives, why? Because most of the people are illiterate and they found ways in which by listening they can be negative influence and the counter-speeches, as somebody else said, are positive interest. Don't, uh, so therefore, I think uh, fighting literacy has to be in very close collaboration 
with all this politics that you are a specialist and I am not in making. And of course, you do a lot. You're doing a lot. Thank you for this. And thank you to UNESCO and thank you to SHS. But it has to be political commitment in each country. And maybe you who are specialists can improve this political commitment, which is the hardest part. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the speakers for being with us, for you, for sharing. Uh, we hope this, um, this conversation continues. There's a lot of things to continue doing. And of course, from the side of UNESCO, particularly from our office in Montevideo, the regional office, we, we will try to continue putting this topic in, in, in the agenda. I finally want to thank our rapporteur, Guillermo Canela, from Communication and Information Center, and our online moderator, Piero, for their help. Thank you very much. really a problem. Hi everyone, uh, the Seed Alliance Award Ceremony is going to start at 1.30, so if you are not staying for this session, we would really appreciate that you vacate the room, and if you want to come and see the winners for the Community Networks and Gender Empowerment Awards, please stay and join us. Thank you. <laughs>